Today, I'm joined by one of the most recognized and iconic founders in the beauty industry, Federic Fakai. With almost three decades in hair care, Federic has truly transformed the category by continuing to innovate high performance salon professional products. Stay with us for more on this. Hi everyone and welcome to Founded Beauty, a podcast dedicated to beauty entrepreneurs that built some of the biggest brands today and where we learn exactly how they did it. We'll cover some of the most intimate stories, their path to success and how they overcame the obstacles along the way. I'm Akash Mehta, CEO and co-founder of Fable & Main, a modern hair wellness brand inspired by ancient Indian beauty secrets. Building Fable & Main has been an incredible journey so far and I decided to launch this podcast as a founder keen to learn and connect with fellow beauty brand founders around the world. I believe in collaboration over competition, and so I'm using this platform as a way to hopefully help and inspire each other in what can be quite a tough and lonely journey. So if you are an entrepreneur or simply just curious how to build a brand, this podcast is perfect for you. So without further ado, it's a like to welcome our guest for today, Federic Fakai. He is one of the most acclaimed hairstylists and founders in the industry. And Frederick Fukai has been shaping the global beauty landscape for almost three decades. From a salon owner to a celebrity hairstylist, working the likes of Claudia Schiffer, Renee Zellweger and Hillary Clinton, Frederick Fukai became synonymous with luxurious hair care, launching his own collection of salon professional products in 1995. Since relaunching his brand in 2018, Frederick has continued his mission to evolve the hair care space with a renewed brand philosophy of clean without compromise. Prioritizing a sustainable future, Fakai salons are green circle salons and recycle 95% of their beauty waste, while Frederick introduced the brand's green aerosol collection, the first planet-friendly, non-ozone depleting aerosol propellant. With a goal to further eliminate byproduct waste and carbon emissions, Fakai is as restorative to the hair as the planet, and I couldn't be more excited to hear all about it from the founder himself. It's my absolute honor to have him with us. So, Frederick, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you very much, Akash. What a nice introduction. I'm very flattered. Thank you. Well, thanks to you for doing such amazing stuff. It was hard for me to summarize it in a sentence or two. So I'm, gonna, I'm excited for the podcast because we can go deeper into the journey. But I want to start with my first question I ask all my guests. I'm going to ask you, who in a nutshell is Frederick? You know, Frederick is a, you know, happened to be, a, I think, a serial entrepreneur. Um, what does it mean? You know, I'm a creative at heart. And even when I do business, uh, I find myself trying to create uh, ideas, product, services that are out of the box or innovative. And, and I think it's something that the best thing is, is there's always more to innovate. So it's, it, it becomes timeless, right? Because we go in, we live in a world where every day new, new, new generations to tackle, new problems to solve. Uh, so it keeps us always busy. And I think that's the most important thing about a serial entrepreneur is always something to do, right? And something yes. to fix and solve, which is exciting. Um, but I want to start at the beginning, and then we're going to go into how Fakai started the brand. But um, I know you were born in as in Provence, and I love that you say Provence born, Paris trained, New York City made. Like this is like a little um, statement I read online, and I was like, that is already so much to go into. Um, so let's start at Provence. Um, do you have any early memories of beauty growing up in in France? You know, it's interesting because I felt I feel blessed to have been to have been born and raised in uh, Aix-en-Provence. It's a, an amazing city. It's an amazing region. No wonder uh, most of the celeb celebrity artists, uh, Van Gogh, Picasso, Cezanne, and so on, uh, live there uh, mm -hmm. because of the beauty, the light around it, but also the rich history, the great culture that uh, 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 has transpired there. Aix-en-Provence has been an incredible inspiration for me for aesthetic. It's beautiful. The architecture, um, the lifestyle, and so on. And plus, France, as you all know, is a, you know the capital of 
fashion of luxury good and uh, so that has really impacted the way i see and do my business and you know for me i i i always saw france as one of the most beautiful places but it's only when you live in france you really understand the true meaning of its beauty and i lived in paris for three years uh, i used to work at dior and i used to travel around france south of france and i can tell you like i can I'm kind of very jealous or envious of people that had the chance to be born there because I think the amount of enriched culture, beauty, um, people don't see it when they just go for one week in Paris. You know what I mean? You have to be living there. And I think that's something that I'm, I always wanted to ask you that, like, what was it like? And I believe it. it that's really cool to know. But then you moved to um, Paris um, at some point. Did you start learning? Like, what was your first introduction into hair um, in those early years? So, well, it's, it's been a long journey, but uh, uh, an interesting journey. Uh, I was in, living in Aix-en-Provence and I wanted to go to the fine art school in Paris called Les Beaux-Arts, you, I'm sure you know very well. Uh, and my dad didn't want to hear anything about that. So I went to law school. Uh, however, you know, uh, I, I came from a modest family and I needed to earn some money. And I did some modeling. I was lucky to do some modeling. And there I met an amazing hairstylist. Uh, she was quite famous in France. And uh, she took me under her wing. And I won't go into all the details, but I left law school and start working with her. And that's how I started my career in Paris. And uh, there, luck strike again, I met at the studio, actually at the L Magazine studio, uh, mm-hmm. the creative director of the company called Jacques de Sange, a salon, you know, uh, operation. Uh, and he asked me to come to New York to open their first hair salon. Wow. And of course I, did, I said yes. I mean, who who wouldn't? But were, were you nervous? Was it like a... Because obviously, did you get to visit New York before this point or was it your first time visiting New York? No, you know, it, I didn't know New York. I never been to New York. But, you know, yeah. when you're that age, I was 19, basically, uh, you know, I was excited. I mean, you know, you, you, when you're so young, you are daredevil. You know what I mean? You basically try it and you don't have much to lose. So this was a very exciting moment. So you moved to New York. I I want to know, did you go with like a plan to stay for many years or did you just go with one suitcase? And then how did it start the journey into New York? It's a funny uh, uh, story. You know, I came to New York. I find a a, a sublet through the Village Voice while I was in Paris. So didn't know anything about it. Uh, But I find myself living in the... Uh, Lower East Village on 14th Street, Avenue C, which was at the time, I mean, really sketchy. And uh, um, so uh, <laughs> this, uh, I didn't stay too long there. I moved obviously uptown. And um, and then, uh, you know, uh, the salon was supposed to open, but ha- wasn't ready for another six to eight months. Wow. And it was very difficult. New York is expensive, as you know. So I didn't know if I could stay or not. But uh, I find I, I met uh, a, a photographer that asked me to work on a shoot, and that helped me and uh, really me introduced me to actually all the amazing magazines such as Vogue, Glamour, and etc. And that's how. Uh, I started my career to work as a studio and kept me in New York until the salon would open. Wow. Okay. So then the salon opened. So what was that like? Oh, did you did you cover like what parts of that, I guess, project uh, did you work on? Was it 360? Was it on? Uh, what so so I, I was lucky to be actually a stylist that could work both in salon and in studio. So hmm. by doing both, uh, I was exposed, obviously, to uh, fashion, to beauty, but to models, supermodels, uh, celebrity, red carpet, and, and then also work in the salon and translate uh, to uh, 
consumer to customer. Um, and that helped me to really be the build a, a, a client list pretty fast, or, which was uh, uh, amazing. So then, you know, you, you got to work with some of the greatest um, people in the industry uh, and do their hair. Uh, I'm sure the, you then were working with a lot of different products, right? And then was there a moment where you were like, I know what these people want, but I think there's still a gap in the market for a brand that I can think about creating. Uh, yeah, when, when did that seed start? It was interesting, you know, back then, you know, this is the early 90s. Um, mm. When uh, you looked at the healthcare landscape, you know, products were mostly commodities, and you know, and the big players were, you know, the big corporation such as a, a Unilever, a PNG, L'Oreal, and so on. And the the products were mostly distributed in, in mass market, uh, and uh, there was no so much innovation. And then when I saw my customer, you know, and checked what they were what their beauty routine was, I would find out that skincare was so innovative, so more sophisticated uh, than hair care. And that gave me the idea to go and develop formulas uh, with a skincare lab. And uh, that placed the line at a much uh, higher level and gave me a different distribution than food, drug and mass and uh, to go to a uh, specialty store, department store, and then of course Sephora and Ulta at the end. That's, uh, and that's amazing because at that time, you know, now you see the skinification of hair, all this ingredient storytelling, but in the 1990s, this was very innovative, right? I think you really did open up a whole new wave of, I guess, what hair care is considered at today. Um, so that's just a little moment to say thank you for that, because as a hair care brand myself, I think we owe it to visionaries like you who, who really, thank you. even e even to the chemists, right, the labs, I think it's important for them to realize that hair care is more than just three, four dollar shampoos and drugstores, you know, there is there is a market there, there is an, there's an opportunity there. Um, and, and now, thank God, I think you look at the industry, there's a lot of education that's starting to happen on hair health and and that's uh, needing the right products. So you obviously had this uh, 1995, the launch. So can you tell us about what was that like? How did you launch and what were the first few products? And at the same time, also explain your, your salon strategy that was starting to accompany this as well. Yes. So as I said earlier, you know, I love innovation. I love creating idea out of the box. And, you know, um, and I was never a real big fan of a hair salon because I found it that they were just pretty uh, 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 ordinary, basic. So when I created my first salon at Bird of Goodman, you know, it was a, actually women's wear called it the, the first day spa. And mm -hmm. to me, it was about an experience, an environment. And so I wanted to do something that didn't look like a hair salon. Of course, the design, but also the services. So uh, I would have a beauty institute, uh, uh, the hair color department, the hair styling department. Uh, we were the first one to create a beauty bar. You know, a beauty bar became a trend, but we started in the 90s, uh, you know, in 1992, wow. actually, a beauty bar uh, was actually run by the time by Bobby Brown, the famous Bobby Brown makeup mm -hmm. artist. And, uh, and I had also a Cafe Vienna uh, adjacent to the salon, which would serve my customer with incredible, you know, snack, lunch, breakfast. And also back then, this will date me, you know, there was no cellular phone. So I had at every station a landline for our customer. So it was really already the ultimate luxury experience there. And the staff were wearing a designer uniform from Ralph Lauren to Carrie Klein to Marc Jacobs and, and so on. And uh, when I saw that my customer, you know, basically my customer gave me the idea of product. So for instance, the first customer that came to me and says, you know, Frederick, you got to do something. My hair color is fading too fast. And I realized that there was no product in the market that would save and protect 
hair color. And so that's how I came up with the idea to the first technician color hair care to protect and keep you know the color vibrant uh, for a long time. That's amazing. And, and did you feel um, like on that journey, did you have um, you know a lot of experience in creating products or did you learn as you go? Because I can tell you, like for me, I, I used to work in corporate. I have no experience in creating hair brands, but you bring all these amazing labs and chemists and you learn on the journey. Um, what was your main mindset when you started? Was it like, I want to build it steadily, slow, and slow wins the race? Or was it like, go fast? Uh, what were you thinking at the beginning time? You know, uh, at the time I was really thinking about uh, filling the gap, a void, mm. if you will, in the healthcare industry. And yeah. to me, it was about, you know, not going fast because first of all, I, I didn't have the, the financial mean exactly. and and yeah. second uh, I, I didn't have the infrastructure but i was again lucky to have one of my customers who had an agency of product development and yeah. that helped me to go and recruit the right chemist the right lab uh, to uh, uh, to to manufacture to formulate our product but very importantly in the salon it's the best basically the best uh, uh, place to taste, to test and to, uh, uh, to find the ideas. For instance, you know, very much I was mixing product to make sure that I would get the benefit I needed for the, for the hair uh, texture or for the treatment. So those are, that's how my ideas originated to give a great brief, if you will, to the, to the lab. Yeah, no, that's a re and I think it's important. Like, um, I think today the reason why fast is a big word is there's a lot of brands. And sometimes when you have a great idea, you know, a lot of people will do it or do it quicker. And sometimes it's about because of financial power, right? They can go quicker because they have the means. But actually what you just said is very important. There are other ways to, you know, speed up things by having the right either partners or, you know, you don't, money is important for sure. We all know that, but uh, the, I think at the same time, you know, it shouldn't stop you because a lot of my founder friends who are starting off, they feel very demotivated because of their financial means. And I think I try to say to them, you can still innovate without financial means, right? There's other ways to go further and faster. Um, and, and you did that at a time where also you had the battle of, you were one of the first doing it right? Uh, as you said, day spa, Absolutely. these are things now it's a trend, right? Everyone's rushing to create these environments that are like ecosystems. But then um, I think they only have done that because you've proven the concept. I can tell you when I went to one of the Fakai salons, um, and I, I think it was on Fifth Avenue, I've never experienced a place like that. And it really did rethink of what I feel now a hair salon experience should be, right? Um, and uh, that's a that's a luxury. That's an that's an amazing feeling to have. So, yeah, you should be really proud Thank of that. Um, really, really proud. Um, so, I want to talk about obviously Fakai today because for me, as a conscious consumer, uh, someone who's you know vegan, thinking about cruelty free, um, and the planet, I'm very excited to see Fakai reborn to where it is today. Um, but tell us a little bit about the journey because I know at one point there was um, a. a Procter & Gamble came involved and now it's back into your hands. I think it's important for people listening, some of the learnings that came on that journey because a lot of brands right now are thinking about exiting or selling, uh, but don't know the true realities of that. So, You know, it's interesting because, you know, once you have uh, uh, your company, your brand, uh, and you are, you know, invested at heart, passionate and uh, you uh, my you know you are really growing this brand you you know you want to try to do and then you know because circumstances you may have to sell or need some cash infusion uh, then you could either have a partner or somebody like in my case Procter & Gamble wanted to acquire the brand and they did um, it's not obvious for a huge corporation uh, to to nurture and build a brand. Uh, they are more suited and more equipped 
to take a brand that has already some uh, platform and scale to exactly. basically grow the scale uh, much bigger. But when the brand needs still attention, brand building, and so on, it's not the best environment when you are sitting around, you know, a, a big corporation that has a multi-brand and most of them are at a billion dollars revenues. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's a very important thing because uh, you have to think about what does the brand need just as much as you as the founder, right? And I think in those moments, it can be hard. Uh, we've had, I mean, we're three years in Fable and Maine, and I've had conversations with some big conglomerates who who want a piece of the pie now, right? They come and they butter you up and they say, oh, just give us a little bit now, and then you lock them in. And you have to, and I've worked in com big companies, right? LVMH, Estee Lauder. I know the game of these companies. It's it's really bottom line, top line. It's, it's talking about what is it money making? And after there'll be a sudden day where if it's not making good enough money, they'll look at the numbers above the potential sometimes and then they'll cut or they'll, they'll strip. And it's a little bit risky when you come in a portfolio brands because someone is always going to be the priority and someone's going to be the least of the priority. But potential often gets left behind and that nurturement is often overlooked of, you know, this isn't a race, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not a sprint, it's, there's a long-term plan here for the biggest brands today, the heritage luxury brands that withstand. And I always found it very hard, I don't know about you, but you often see these big companies talking about sustainability and their, you know, ESG agenda, yet the way they sometimes run companies, I'm like, it's not very ESG-minded, because, you know, you have to think about the longevity. But what I was really excited about was seeing how you brought Fakai back now into your, your hands. Um, kind of was one of the few examples in the industry where I was like, as a founder, I'm like, that's a really inspiring story. Like, there's always a way to boomerang back to you if, you, if it needs to be. It's not always goodbye. Um, and I think for me, that's something that I will think about when I, my journey with Fable and Maine. So now it's back to you, and that's super exciting. So tell us about now Fakai today and the, the mission of it. So uh, now that uh, I bought back my Namesake brand, you know, I wanted to make sure I came with a, a new idea and yeah. a relevant idea for the lifestyle we have today. Uh, yeah. So it's without saying that it had to be sustainable. And it had to be formulated with clean ingredients, green formula. So this is the mission I have today. But obviously, it's a challenge because, you know, uh, when you do that, uh, you know, you have to make sure that you still focus and um, propose to the consumer some performance and some performance formulas. So yeah. today, uh, you know, we are proud to say that uh, are, you know, we are driven to really create products that are obviously uh, have incredible benefit to the hair, yeah. whether it's a treating or styling, but also that will not harm the, 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 the environment. So as I said earlier, I love to come up with idea out of the box. And, uh, you know, I'm very proud to say that was one of the first one to use green aerosol. Uh, based on sources as opposed to gas, so it doesn't deplete uh, deplete the ozone, and uh, and it's also for us hairstylists when you spray a lot, you don't sneeze, you don't get any allergy out of this. Um, so this is an example, but also most of our products are you know uh, uh, made with the ingredients that are either organic or if we use a chemical, we use safe chemicals. Uh, so it's really about, you know, using science uh, uh, with the botanic uh, and the uh, combination and the formulation together uh, becomes an incredible potent uh, formula. So tell us about some of the hero products today. So for anyone listening, I'm going to put the link in the, in the summary so people can go on the website at the same time. But what are some of your hero products that you think everyone should try obviously it depends on the hair type and you've got a perfect yes. find my yes. routine you know you can find on your website a little quiz as well but yeah for those listening 
you know, uh, uh, today, you know, and for a good reason, the full volume shampoo and uh, conditioners are the best sellers. Uh, but also uh, the uh, amazing product called the Glossy Cream Plus, uh, who is universal. So you could use it. Uh, uh, and somebody with curly hair can use it. Somebody with long hair can use it. Somebody with a highlight can use it. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's it's really for everybody. And what does it do? It's a product that basically refreshes the hair. So it gives, and this is what American loves it so much because it's yeah. v visible ins instantly. So you see instantly the the benefit and the difference on your hair. It smooths the textures. Uh, 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 gives you shine and also uh, help you uh, define your hairstyle. Yeah, oh, that's amazing. I, and I love the fact that you've got a lot of information on the website from your ingredients to how to use. It's making the journey very easy for the modern consumer because we live in a very fast world. And I'm curious for you who spent a lot of time in the chair, you know, with people in salons, to now having to switch a lot of the marketing to, you know, TikTok, three seconds, social media. How has that been like for you? Uh, like, obviously you have to embrace it. It's the, today it's the new normal, but uh, it can be quite overwhelming, right? <laughs> a lot of different, yeah. It, it is, and you know, it's obviously a learning curve, you know, uh, and you have to surround yourself with a, 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 a great team that really understand that. Uh, yeah. And really, uh, uh, not only knows how to publish, uh, 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 but also uh, study the 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 the, the, the diagnostic, the the metrics of uh, uh, what uh, is the return on investment on that. Um, yeah. I, I think today, you know, it's actually if you do that well, it's really great because that's how you basically present, articulate uh, the brand. And to me, what is exciting, uh, you know, of course, I'm in the business of selling product and that's without saying, but what I really think will trigger the sales is because, you know, you, you demonstrate, you show, you present your brand in such a way that is, uh, 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 that is uh, uh, desirable, uh, yep. uh, valuable and trustable. That's very, very important. And I think, you know, especially trust uh, as much as you can, you know, your own brand uh, account and stuff, but also the right advocates and ambassadors. So what I've loved is seeing um, a lot of my influencer, social media friends, um, they talk very highly of Fakai and they, they always, uh, and, and, and it feels really organic, like off, you know, yes, you pay, right, for a post and we all do that. But I can tell you off the the social media i see it in the shower they continue to use it and that's a really exciting feeling to know that you're reaching all these people through social media and they're becoming lovers of the brand not just sellers of the brand and i think that's something i've i've tried to tell myself like it can be quite uh draining to know we have to pay to play in a lot of these places because it's the name of the game but generally mm. you know they, when they love it, that's worth it as well. Like it's like, okay, I know you need money. Here's money, but at the same time, I'm glad you're using it. That's the most important, you know. That's that's from, it's not put on the side in a box somewhere, you know. So that's Absolutely. exciting, I think. Um, so in terms of now the future of Fakai and uh, you know, I guess more products. What, what are you what are you planning on the horizon? Well, the future of Fakai is really based on you know obviously innovation, new product development as well. But, yeah. you know, also making sure that, you know, growing the brand, building the brand awareness. So the, the, the number one priority is really brand awareness to make sure that, you know, uh, people uh, can uh, associate with the brand and, and really want to be part of the brand, uh, uh, the brand uh, uh, aspiration. So yeah. I, 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 what I'm really excited about this is really about, to me, as I said earlier, it's about helping my customer. You know, mm. obviously uh, 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 we are in business to sell product, as I said, but the most important part is that how can you help somebody to feel good, to feel beautiful, to, to exude 
self-confidence and uh, to say, wow, Fekai has helped me to do that. That's, yeah. that's to me the success. That is and, and no better feeling than that. And, and, and one, one thing I do want to ask, though, is about you said about, you know, grow into more places. Where are you guys currently distributed? And for anyone listening around the world, where can they find you? So we are mostly in the in the US, but we also have some uh, uh, in the UK, and uh, 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 and we just launched as we speak uh, right now in France. But in the US, we are distributed on at Ulta Beauty, uh, yep. uh, most uh, retail stores, and also some specialty stores. So, uh, for instance, Nordstrom, um, yeah. uh, you know, uh, Bloomingdale's, and so on, and Space NK. Uh, you know that in yep. uh, in the UK. Uh, and also our D2C. So I'm really uh, 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 delighted to say that uh, our D2C is growing ex- exponentially great. Uh, and that is uh, that is important. That is very important. And, and I think it's important to make sure you, you have that direct relationship with your customers. So when they absolutely feedback, you know, you can help with product development and uh, changing and growing as a brand and get closer to them. So that's a very important fact. Um, So now before we go into fire round questions, um, I have a sort of desert island situation for you. So imagine I'm inviting you and I hope, Frederick, one day this will be a reality where I can actually invite all my founder friends to a retreat. That's my goal one day, like a little like a school trip, you know, where we can all brainstorm and have fun. But for now, imagine you're coming to this virtual retreat, but you can only bring one Fakai product with you. What is your one product you will bring with you to this island? That's a, actually a good question. You know, I would actually bring the glossing cream plus yeah. because the glossing cream is, you know, the ultimate uh, band-aid, if I could. The, the, yeah. the, you know, it fixes everything. So so if I'm on this other island, you know, obviously I could... Uh, 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 rinse or wash my hair with water and stuff like that and then yeah. the glossing cream will just do the magic to yeah. to sh- to uh, make my hair shiny healthy and 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 and, and manageable i love that okay so five round questions and then uh i'm gonna leave you to it i know we have a busy day for businesses to run but my first question this is first thing that comes to your mind so the first question is What's another beauty brand, and it could be, you know, skin, fragrance, any industry, that you're currently loving right now? Um, interesting. What a beauty brand that I'm currently loving. Um, you know, I use, let me start with that. I yeah. use uh, Clarins, Clarins skincare myself. Uh, and, you know, uh, it does wonder for me because they have... Uh, an uh, incredible uh, facial cream uh, and a serum that helps really uh, hydrate. I have a very dry skin and uh, so uh, help hydrate. And also they have a, 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 a an oil, a shaving oil that I love very much. Nice. Clarence, I like that. My next question is, do you have a favorite quote or a saying that you keep close to your heart? Yes, uh, I do. Um, I always say, you know, uh, it's a French saying, but I'm going to say it in English, is that, yeah. you know, uh, uh, chasing the natural in you yeah. will uh, always that. come back full gallop. Can you say it in French as well? Uh, I speak yes. French. So just... <laughs> Chasser le naturel et il reviendra au galop. I love that. Super. That's a really good one. I think everyone should remember this. Um, And my last question, Frederick, is if you weren't in the beauty industry, what would Frederick be doing right now? You know, it's a very good question because I do ask myself that question many times. You know, I love experiences. So I would love to uh, have what I would call a hospitality, hospitality uh, business, mm-hmm. whether it's a, a hotel or a resort, but something really uh, about wellness. So yeah. it's about, again, another environment where we can help people to feel great uh, and educate them to live a better life. 
Oh, I, you know, it's so funny you say that. that me and my sister, uh, our goal, like long term, would be uh, create like a retreat or like a, a modern ashram version in the Western world where people can come and just, you know, non-profit, really just think about making an environment where people can escape and be with themselves. Um, there are amazing that's a, places. That's a great initiative. Maybe we should talk later. But, um, but you know, th that's a great idea that doesn't really exist here it exists we know in india and places further away but not everyone can go to these places so quickly so there is i find there's not enough centers in london paris that people can escape and and, and is affordable right it can't be too um, exactly. expensive for everyone so i love that exactly. well where can everyone follow uh Fikai and yourself on social media to make sure they stay up to date well, you know, it, it, it's interesting because, uh, you know, today you can really follow live what we do on, on obviously our social media social. channel, whether it's yeah. uh, uh, Instagram or TikTok uh, and yeah. obviously our website as well uh, and and more to come. Perfect. Well, it's uh, at Fakai, anyone listening and also Frederick Fakai. His, his Instagram, I'll put all the links on the website in the summary so people can tap straight Thank away. You. And I encourage everyone to try the products. As a hair care brand myself, I use Fakai and I'm the new Fakai because it's a lot more aligned to my morals today, but clean and sustainable. So I'm very excited for the new products to come and uh, very excited to have you in the podcast. So thank you, Frederick, for your time. Thank you very much, Akash. It's uh, lovely to be with you guys and uh, I wish you also great success with your podcast. Thank you. <laughs>